Dear Richard, welcome back to Stockholm. Thank you. <laughs> um, the music you heard now, it's actually a song by David Bowie called Fascination. Uh, has fascination and the sense of wonder been your driving force through your career? Of course it has. How could you not be fascinated by science? Science is reality, and reality is utterly fascinating. Yeah. Uh, to think that we are here, somehow we, we understand what gave us our existence, what gave the universe existence, the slow, gradual process of evolution, which led from the origin of life through billions of years, about four billion years, eventually to us, and so now we can turn a mirror on the process in our own minds and actually understand what happened. That is an astounding, fascinating fact. Mm. I know that uh, the day before yesterday, you were the keynote speaker at the Gothenburg Science Festival, and you spoke on the subject, what should we tell the aliens, which <laughs> it's an interesting title. And maybe you should explain what you meant by that, because you say there are certain co knowledge that must be common in the whole universe. It was just a, a little device to talk about science and um, mm -hmm. our own attitude to ourselves. Uh, if you imagine that we ever were visited by aliens, and I don't think we ever will be, but <laughs> uh, if we were, what would we have to talk to them about? Um, and I, I made the point that uh, it would certainly be them visiting us rather than us visiting them, because we are, we're in no position to venture further than our own solar system. Um, and then I ma made the point that there would just be a kind of physics filter. If, if they ever got here, they would have to be very advanced physicists. And so the, the bare minimum of what we could talk to them about would be physics. Mm. Then I wanted to go on as a biologist to say, well, would we also have something in common biologically? Mm. And there I stuck my neck out a bit and said that, um, yes, I think that uh, whatever else, however alien and strange they might be, the one thing they would have in common biologically is that they would have evolved by a form of Darwinian natural selection. Mm. So you think that the, the natural selection phenomena must be a universal driving force if there is life? Yes, I think it's the only, in a very general sense, it's the, it's the only mechanism for generating adaptive complexity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One thing that I've been thinking about a bit is that we as a species, species I mean humans, we've developed a cognitive capability that is, of course, extraordinary. We have Einstein, Darwin, these fantastic thinkers. But <clears throat> why did evolution create that kind of cognitive talent? I mean, uh, if evolution works for survival only, why is it developing cognitive abilities to understand such complex things as quantum mechanics? It's, it's almost a paradox, isn't it, that, that our brains were naturally selected to survive and reproduce in the African savanna yeah. uh, when um, all you needed to do was to cope with objects that move at sort of moderate speeds, like the speed of a lion or the speed of a buffalo. Um, and yet our species managed to produce brains of the caliber of an Einstein who could mm. work out the strange effects of traveling at nearly the speed of light. And rather than just simply the, the moderately sized objects that we were naturally selected to deal with, our brains were naturally selected to deal with, we are capable, or some of us are, certainly not me, capable of uh, understanding um, quantum theory, uh, which is way, way away from, from anything that we, our brains were naturally selected to, to do. So it is a sort of paradox. Yeah. It's an emergent property. Something about what was necessary to survive in Africa in the Pleistocene automatically had the emergent effect of being capable of, of doing relativity and quantum theory. It's a little bit like the electronic computer, which is a computer, it's a calculating machine. And yet, once you've built a high-speed programmable calculating machine, automatically has an emergent property. It's capable of playing chess, simulating the city of Vancouver, um, mm. simulating the future, uh, translating languages. Um, none of that was 
in a sense, directly built into the original calculating machine, and yet, yeah. as an emergent property, it can do it. I think the human brain's a bit like that. Do you, could, you, could you even say that these capabilities of, the, of humans are a side effect of, of evolution? A kind of side effect, but in a very grand way. I mean, it, it side effect doesn't really do justice to it. Mm -hmm. I see what you mean, yeah. Um, some people today, maybe this is an exaggeration, but I, I feel that some people today tend to think of science just as a, a narrative created by the Western world. And, oh. and, you know, and they, they sort of relativize this in a way. Are, are, you, are you worried that that kind of attitudes are spreading? I can't tell you how I despise that kind of <laughs> point of view. Um, <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> science works. Mm. Uh, science is the way to get at the truth about the universe. Mm. Uh, and um, it, it, of course, it's interesting to study, anthropologically to study, uh, the systems of knowledge which have been developed by tribal peoples all over the world. They're fascinating, they're beautiful, they're aesthetically satisfying. And anthropologists immerse themselves in these cultures and have to, to immerse themselves. Not just learn the language, but they have to feel their way into the culture in a very deep way. And sometimes they get carried away and seduced into the false belief that the alternative way of knowing which their particular tribe has of the, of the world and the universe is just as true. And that the scientific worldview is just our Western white mm. culture, uh, tribal culture, bollocks. <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, I know that you're following the debate on all these issues closely, and uh, sometimes I get the feeling that certain universities are very, very scared of taking the position you do. They want to be friends with everyone, and Cambridge, for example, in, in your home country, it's been a lot of discussions on what's going on there, on an mm. academic level. I, I've met this peripherally with controversy in New Zealand, actually, where mm -hmm. um, there's a movement in New Zealand, government-sponsored movement in New Zealand, to give Maori ways of knowing equal, equal weight to, to science, scientific ways of knowing in science classes. And, um, of course, it's interesting to study Maori ways of knowing, but it's no more interesting than any other of the thousands of tribes around the world whose ways of knowing you could, you could study. The fact that it happens to be in New Zealand is irrelevant because mm. the world isn't different. The universe doesn't, isn't different in New Zealand from the way the universe is in America or Britain or Sweden. Um, so uh, by all means study tribal cultures, but there's no particular reason in New Zealand to study or rather to elevate the culture of the Maoris mm. into science classes in New Zealand any more than the um, culture of the Yanomamo. But you could, maybe you could say it in another way. You could say, of course, they should present their way of knowing and let's test if it works or not. Yes, but then again, as I said, there are hundreds of different cultures around the world. Yeah. You could do that as, as well with yeah, There's yeah. no particular reason to pick on the tribal culture in the country where you are. Mm. Science is universal. So there's, no, there's no such thing as Western science, Eastern science, Japanese science, Chinese mm. science, it's just mm. science. Mm. <clears throat> we, we're soon moving it over into your, your specific scientific uh, work, but I want to ask you one more question first. Um, you say that you think that natural selection and evolution in a way is universal. It's, it's one way or another it should apply to all species in the universe if there are others. Do you think also that the DNA structure is universal? Oh, I doubt that. I mean, I, I think it, it's an interesting, debatable question uh, whether the... Well, I think there has to be some kind of genetics, there has mm. to be some kind of heredity. Uh, but then we could ask the question, does it have to be digital? DNA genetics is fundamentally, deeply, profoundly digital. Mm. Uh, and does that have to be the case? I suspect the answer is yes, but I don't know. Um, I think that for Darwinian evolution to work, 
there has to be a, a very high fidelity of, gen of information transfer. Mm. Not total, but very, very high fidelity. And digital coding does that. So I suspect it probably does have to be digital, but does it have to be a one-dimensional string of information, which DNA is, or could it be, say, a two-dimensional matrix? That's another possible speculation mm. that we could have. Mm. Does there have to be sex? Probably not, but maybe that's an arguable position. Mm. But there is a lot of species on Earth that doesn't reproduce with sex. And some that don't. Yeah, N don't, that's what I mean. Ye right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, there are. I'd like to invite our first guest up on stage, the professor of evolutionary genetics, Hanna Johannesson. Welcome. <laughs> Hanna, welcome. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. You are a professor of evolutionary genetics. Um, uh, is there any other genetics than evolutionary, by the way? Why is it not just genetics? <laughs> well, I think there is an aspect of studying genetics from the evolutionary perspective that's different from genetics from a more functional perspective. Mm -hmm. So you can be studying molecular genetics, is the regulation of genes, and more, more specifically towards the molecular biology. And, mm -hmm. and my speciality is more um, connecting evolution and genetics. That's why mm -hmm. I think it's, that's the title. Um, okay, let me fast first ask you then, you were probably not even born when the selfish gene came out, but uh, you have read it? I, st I started, re I've read most of it, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 did, 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 what did it mean to you? I mean, did you read it when you were young? Or no, no, I read, read it, it uh, okay. when I was actually uh, already a researcher. Okay. And I've been very, uh, myself, very intrigued by um, selfish genetic elements, like transposable elements, and I told Richard before here that I spent uh, the last uh, years, uh, 10 years possibly, working on uh, meiotic drive elements, which are really the essence of selfish behavior at the gene level, because they, in, if two parents cross, one having this selfish gene, the other one doesn't, all the offspring has that variant of the copy, mm -hmm. or that copy of, of the variant that is af acting through meiosis or after meiosis to actually kill all the siblings to get 100% represented in the what offspring. Did, wait, wait, what did you say? You used a word here that I didn't understand. Uh, so, if you, if, you are, if you are a carrier of, mm -hmm. uh, of this uh, genetic uh, variant, mm -hmm. it's a, an allele of, 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 of a gene, mm -hmm. and then you uh, reproduce or sexually with another uh, who's not carrier of this allele, mm -hmm. In, uh, if you follow the Mendel's law of equal segregation, which is one of the few laws in biology, then uh, your offspring would have 50% of them would have one allele and 50% would have the other one. And in this type of genes, uh, all offspring have just uh, one oh. of the variants. Okay, okay. And that's uh, because it acts during meiosis to just push away the siblings to get 100% representation in next generation. Very so selfish gene. Very selfish. So I... Um, uh, well... <laughs> Those segregation distorters are sometimes called ultra-selfish genes. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's a special case of a selfish gene. Um, all genes are selfish in my sense, um, but ultra-selfish genes are these segregation distorters, the ones which get themselves reproduced differentially more than they should. Um, they're kind of parasitic, mm. um, and that they're important. And I, um, I, I dealt with them a bit in, in the selfish gene, but it's, it's a kind of distraction to use the, the word selfish gene in my sense and confuse it with selfish gene in the sense of a segregation distorter or an ultra-selfish gene. An ultra-selfish gene would be one which, well, it, there is a case in mice, for example, the so-called T-lockers in mice, where uh, male mice that have this, this allele, the so-called T al allele, instead of producing, um, f as you say, Hannah, a 50% chance of getting into each sperm, it has a greater than 50% chance of getting into each sperm. So it spreads like, a, like an epidemic, like a plague, through the population. And eventually it probably drives the population extinct because uh, there are too, too, too many of the, um, of the segregation distorters. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an ultra-selfish gene mm. to be distinguished from 
my sense, which is that all genes are selfish in the sense that they are manipulating the bodies in which they find themselves to get passed on into the next generation. So when, an, when a field biologist looks at a lion or a, or a giraffe or something and asks why it does what it does, the answer is because its genes are making it do, it do whatever it does in order to propagate the very same genes that make them do it. So that's a, a rather weaker sense of selfish than, than, yes. than yours. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yes, but anyway, I had this mindset when I read your, gene, uh, your book, and then I was thinking that from my perspective, I think, uh, you know, all life is built hierarchically, so we have genes, we have cells, and multicellular bodies that are, of course, we, by definition, they are formed of many, many cells, and then we have uh, groups of individuals. And at each of these levels, we could actually find natural selection acting on the gene, on the cell, on the body, and potentially also on groups of individuals. And uh, so from my perspective, what we're talking about is, is multi-level selection, or what we say, selection occurring at different levels. Do you agree with this, Richard? Yeah. That's no. <laughs> <laughs> Good, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> to quote the poet W.B. Yeats, you are still wrecked among heathen dreams. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. No, 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 okay, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, we, we have indeed a hierarchy of levels of organization. Mm. Uh, and we have groups, we have we're species and groups, and we have individuals and we have communities and we have individuals and we have cells and so on. Genes aren't like that. They don't belong in that hierarchy. And the reason they don't belong in that hierarchy is that only genes, only genetic information, has the capacity to get passed down the generations an indefinite number of times. So when we talk about natural selection, we need to, we need to pick on an entity in that hierarchy of, mm. of levels. We need to pick on an entity which has the capacity to either survive or not survive in the long run down through the, through the generations. Nothing else in the hierarchy of life does that. Only genes have the capacity to survive indefinitely in the form of copies down many generations. Therefore, the ones that do survive are the ones we talk about as being natu naturally selected. Bodies aren't like that. Communities aren't like that. Bodies die. Only genes go on into, into, the, into the future. And so although I um, fully accept the rhetoric of hierarchy of levels of organization, I would dispute the idea that natural selection goes on at all those levels. <laughs> so, but Richard, then uh, if we think, uh, okay, uh, what we also discussed a little bit in the room before, that this view is very much centered around unitary organisms like ourselves with a, with a defined body and uh, obligate sexual reproduction. But the majority of life, um, I mean, most animals even, and uh, plants and, and fungi, multicellular uh, complex organisms, do reproduce clonally by budding, and therefore they can basically, the whole genome or the whole or individual can be also immortal in that sense. Yes, now we're talking. I mean, that, you, that's right, because, because <laughs> you work on organisms which, which are not... Exactly. ...nice, neat packages like animals. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and everything that I just said, applies to animals, mm. um, where you have a rather discreet object which has legs and eyes and walks around and does mm. things and behaves and... And then it dies. And, and, and then reproduces and dies. Oh. Um, however, if you are working on an organism like maybe some plants, maybe some fungi, which are not so tidy in their habits, um, <laughs> then... the the rhetoric that I've been employing of selfish genes marching on through the generations does rather tend to break, at least it, it needs revising, it needs, it needs looking at um, carefully. Mm. And I, I haven't thought about that enough. I mean, I, I think about animals. Mm. And so um, what I say applies to animals. I suspect it probably applies more widely than that. Mm. Uh, but I could be persuaded otherwise. Mm. 
<laughs> but, but can I ask you, I yeah. mean, we're already going into some, you, you have different opinions on this, and I think this is very interesting because I wanted to ask you, what are the controversies within your scientific field? You don't agree on everything, obviously. And another, another such thing is group selection, as I understand it. Edward Wilson has been arguing differently than you, Richard, on group selection, or am I wrong? You're right. Um, E.O. Wilson, who just unfortunately died, yeah. a very great man, uh, the world's greatest myrmecologist, entomologist, um, and written several truly great books, including The Insect Societies, Sociobiology, The Ants, and many others. Mm. Um, in The Insect Societies and Sociobiology, he is entirely sound on kin selection, and, or, except that he tends to treat kin selection as a subset of group selection. I doubt if there's time to go into that. Could uh, you explain the concept of group selection, maybe, for the audience? Well, the idea that natural selection chooses between alternative groups, and that doesn't work for the reason I've just said, that, 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 that they are not replicators. You have... Uh, I, I would... Okay. I make a distinction between two, two ways of talking about selection, replicators and vehicles. Mm -hmm. So replicators are the information that gets passed on through the generations, or doesn't, and if it doesn't, then it's selected against. If it, if it does, then it's selected for. Groups aren't like that. Individuals aren't like that. What individuals are is vehicles. They are machines which are built by genes for the propagation of genes. So a, a vehicle is, is something which has legs and teeth and eyes and, and ears and, and hands, and everything about that organism works for the genes that built it. Parche, Hannah's plants and fungi. Which <laughs> and most animals. Which, yeah, yes. <laughs> um, Quite many but, but, organisms. But, yeah. but um, groups are not, are not like that. I mean, gr groups might be, be, be vehicles, but in order for groups to be effective vehicles, you'd have to say that groups have some kind of a <coughs> phenotype. Groups do something for the benefit of the genes that make the groups, and that's not an easy thing to do. Wilson tries to do it. The later Wilson not the early Wilson, the, the later Wilson tries to do that with respect to social insect colonies. Mm -hmm. um, social insect colonies are so much more beautifully explained by kin selection. Genes that manipulate the bodies of individuals for the good of the genes, even in the case where the individuals are sterile, so that they cannot reproduce themselves. And all they can do is assist the reproduction of queens and males who do reproduce. Now, that's a beautiful, elegant idea which Wilson espoused in his earlier books and then, weirdly, in my opinion, uh, in his later work, abandoned that uh, for, for no very good reason that I can tell. Hannah, what's your take on this? Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm with Richard here that uh, for a unit to evolve, it has to reproduce as a unit, and it's hard to see a group of individuals doing this. But, um, but I can see also that this works for, in, for social insects, for example. So it's, not, it's hard sometimes to distinguish an individual from, you know, a unit from, from a, what's less or more than a unit. So in a colony of insects, for example, you can see, okay, different insects are flying around, but they're basically the same genotype. Well, so the, well they're not exactly the same. Mm. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're closely related, but they're, mm. they're, not, they're not a clone. Um, if they were like aphids or stick insects, there would be a clone. That would be, in a way, easier to understand. But um, nevertheless, it's because they're sterile, because the, the, the work of bees, ants, and termites are sterile, the way that their genes work is by pr programming the, the sterile worker bodies to work for the, for the reproduction, the reproductive success, of queens and males. And then the hive itself, or the ant's nest itself, can be said to kind of reproduce when it, in, the, in summer, you see ant's nests erupting with winged 
queens and males flying out in, in, in summer evenings, and they're carrying the genes out to found new colonies, and then a queen will settle down, having mated, will settle down and produce sterile workers. And those sterile workers then work to enhance the reproduction of the queen. So there's a kind of analogy between the, the hive or the ant's nest and an individual body. And it's a good analogy. Um, but the colony could be thought of as a kind of vehicle, but so also could the sterile worker, in, in, worker individuals be seen as sterile. I cannot overemphasize how elegant the theory of kin selection is to explain the social insects. And there's cer certainly not time to go into every detail about it, but it's very, very elegant. Can I ask you a, a somewhat different question b before we go back to, to the actual science? And that question is, in its simplest form, why did you write the selfish gene? And wh what I mean by that is, did you want to correct what you thought was a misunderstanding, or, or did you just feel that, I want to write a book about something I no, love? In, in, the, in the 1960s and 70s, <coughs> there was a series of books which used a kind of unthinking group selection. Uh, mm -hmm. Conrad Lawrence, for example, um, wrote a book called, um, in German, Das Sogenannte Börse, in English, On Aggression, um, yeah. in which he said that things like, the reason why animals don't fight to the death is that it would be bad for the species if they did. Well, that's nonsense. Uh, it, 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 you have to say the reason, you have to think of a, a reason at the individual level why they don't fight to the death. And, and later on, Maynard Smith and people like that came up with, with that theory. Um, but I think we haven't talked to Hannah enough about... Her, um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the difference between animals and plants and fungi, where um, the, th the thing that makes animals so discreet and unitary, from my point of view, is that they have a, what I call a bottleneck life history. They have a very elaborate mitotic cell division to produce a huge, great body, which I see as a, just a, a way for, for genes to make more genes. But the, the bottleneck comes at the, the moment of reproduction when everything zeroes in down on a single <coughs> zygote, a single um, reproductive cell. <coughs> and I think plants aren't always like that, and that's the complication mm. which take on it uh, on the whole evolutionary biology theory is that we need to to include more uh, more uh, organisms which are modularly reproducing and also have uh, uh, actually genetic variation within the body so those who are formed from a single bottleneck as you mentioned they are also very un genetically uniform and if you have a body who's uh, clonally reproducing over um, uh, several uh, many many generations you would of course you will have somatic mutations you will have a heterogeneity a genetic heterogeneity within your organism. And that's expected to be very problematic from the sort of unitary animal point of view, because we think we need to form, be formed by a bottleneck in order to be maintaining our individual. Otherwise, conflict between different genotypes within the body will break us down. Instead, we can see it as a possibility for an individual or a an, an body to actually evolve by clonal reproduction and having somatic mutations arising and they could be selected on uh, over clonal growth. And then in, in this sort of lifestyle, uh, the gene is not uh, separated from other genes by meiosis, as in, in the sort of animal model. And then we need to possibly think a little bit differently about uh, genes being uh, independently uh, evolving. I suppose cancer tumors are the nearest approach we have in animals to mm. that, where a somatic mutation, a mutation in mitosis, produces a clone of, of a variant which, which is genetically slightly different from the rest of the body. And then you have a natural selection process going on within the tumor. And the cells in the tumor are naturally selected to become better at being cancer tumors mm. and eventually killing the animal and killing themselves, of course. But nevertheless, before they kill the animal or the human, they are evolving to become more and more efficient at 
simply spreading through the body. Uh, and they cannot know they're going to kill the animal they're in, and therefore um, mm. themselves. That's one of the things about natural selection. It has no foresight. It just, it's just blind reproduction. And the, the, the faster you reproduce, the more effectively you reproduce, the better. Eventually, you drive yourself extinct, maybe, which is what cancer tumors do. And maybe some animal populations do as well. They, they may reproduce so effectively that they drive themselves extinct. They cannot, they cannot look ahead and foresee the disaster that's looming. Only humans can do that, which is a unique feature of humans. Mm. Mm. Some humans. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Uh, Hannah and Richard, what, what are the what, what more controversies exist in your field today? <coughs> I mean, we, we talked earlier about uh, we discussed whether Richard considers himself a, a um, genetic reductionist or not, for example. Uh, can you? Explain, first of all, what you mean by that, and, and then hear what Richard say. Yes, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm thinking about the... Um, over, over the recent years, we know more and more about epistasis, which is genes actually interact with other genes for their... So it's not... It's very rarely one gene has one phenotype. So usually the genes interact in the genome, and they also have pleiotropic effects, so one gene can affect multiple phenotypes. And then uh, I was thinking whether your view on, on the... On the self, on the gene as the m pure evolving unit, is, um, is it, has no, been it, changed. It, uh, uh, have you reconsidered yeah, your idea? It, it, it's not affected by that. Um, epistatic interactions are a complication which makes no difference to the fundamental logic of what's going on. You could think of the rest of the genome, or rather the rest of the gene pool, actually, of the, of the species is the environment, or a major part of the environment, in which every gene is being naturally selected. Mm. So, uh, what a field biologist sees is interaction with predators and, and prey and parasites and vegetation and things like that. But a far more important interaction is the interaction between genes within the body, epistatic interactions, between genes within, within the body, so that every gene, as it goes through the generations, it is being selected for its success in going through the generations. A major part of that success is success in interacting with the other genes that it is likely to meet in other bodies in its journey down the generations. Now, proximally what that means is other bodies within, sorry, other genes within the same body but of course, in the long run, what that means is other genes in the gene pool, this sexually mixing pool of genes which constitutes the species, because those are the genes which recurrently, over and over and over again, it's going to meet as it marches down through the generations. So a gene that doesn't interact well with the other genes in the gene pool is not going to survive. So I have another question for you, then. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, uh, um, gene, uh, many traits in, in um, animals, for example, are, are uh, polygenic traits, or they're uh, multi-locus traits. And when we have seen those, uh, like, direct evidence of such traits evolving, like, for example, the Galapagos finch beak that evolve due to draft, and, and the seeds are changing the character, and the beaks are changing, like, uh, adapting to that. Um, what do you think about that? Because that, that's really a selection on the phenotype of the animal uh, that's yeah, coded by a number of different genes. Of course, yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, natural selection works on phenotypes. In this case, you're talking about the uh, Galapagos finches studied by Peter and Rosemary Grant, uh, where they, they show that as... Um, um, the seasons change, if there's a, there was a drought one year which favoured finches with a very big, robust beak, uh, because the only seeds that, that, that they could get were very big, robust seeds. Now, natural selection, of course, works on phenotypes, and of course phenotypes are produced by the interaction of many genes. That's 
a given, that's absolutely accepted. It doesn't affect my argument in the slightest, because once again, those genes which are good at interacting with other genes in making phenotypes, in making beaks, or legs, or tails, or feathers, or whatever it might be, the ones that are good at, at making, at cooperating with the other genes, polygenically, to make these phenotypes are the ones that survive. In the selfish gene, I use the analogy of a rowing crew, uh, the boat race, where you have eight men uh, who all need to row together, and um, the coach doesn't know easily which rowers are better than which rowers in building up his crew. So what he does is he puts together sampling of crews, and every time a boat wins, as it were, the men in that crew get given some additional points. So those individuals who tend on the whole to cooperate well with other rowers in, in boats are the ones who will get eventually selected for the final boat race. Uh, that's not a, an ideal an analogy because rowing or rowers are all doing the same thing, whereas in the case of genes, they're all doing different things. But you get the idea that cooperation among genes is... I could have pulled the book, not the selfish gene, but the cooperative gene. It would have worked just as well. <laughs> because that, that's an important part of it. Um, they, they, they cooperate in the interests of their own selfish survival. Mm. And, and uh, do you differ from Richard on, in this respect um, or not? No, yeah, she I think doesn't. <laughs> 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 Actually, I know in a, in a let's say, um, a sector reproducing, reproducing organism with um, uh, um, a high outcrossing frequency, like basically panmixia in a population, I, I agree with Richard, actually. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but I do, I, I, I think my biggest puzzle is that we, we need to broaden up to those who actually uh, evolve clonally and do not break up their association with the genes, because then I think we need to revise sort of the idea or broaden the idea of, of natural selection to, to be on the genome level. Um, you mean when it's not sexual reproduction? Yeah. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I got that. We're, we're I think slowly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, slowly. No, yeah, it was yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. In principle, I I buy this uh, idea of the evolving gene in a, in a in a population that's uh, reproducing sexually at high frequency. Uh, so it's basically a panmictic panmictic population. I'm I'm with you on this, and I understand what you th say about uh, an epistasis being sort of the environment in which the gene is uh, existing and it's within the body, but it's interacting with other genes. Yeah, so no, I was back to this uh, uh, clonality again a bit, but okay. that's a different, it's a different issue. Okay. But I would like to talk <laughs> you to something else, do you, unless you want to continue. Yes, no, go ahead. Yeah, and that's about your, uh, your view on, um, on drift in, in, you know, uh, because um, uh, ev evolution is not necessarily equal to natural selection, no. even if uh, we all... I, I totally, uh, we, most of us agree that, yeah. or all agree that uh, natural selection is a part of evolution. But uh, there's this uh, neutralist view of, um, of evolution being primarily driven by chance and a very small level. So I was wondering what you think about that. Yes, that's, that's important. Um, the, the, the neutral theory, um, mainly promoted by the Japanese geneticist Kimura, so states that if you look Molecularly, if a molecular geneticist looks at the changes in genes, genes that replace other genes in the population, you find that, Kim Kimura says, the vast majority of genetic changes are actually not selective events. They are random um, or, or they're neutral. Um, so, oh. a. a um, oh, that, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, a mutation that produces effectively a synonymous effect is not subject to natural selection. Um, it's a little bit like uh, if you imagine you're using a computer word processor and you change the font from Geneva to Times Roman. Uh, the meaning remains the same, 
but the letters look different. Well, a, a mutation which, at, from a molecular biologist's point of view, is a change, nevertheless has no effect, has no different effect on the actual phenotype, because it, it we simply change the font from Geneva to, to Times Roman. So it, 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 it makes no difference. So from, from the point of view of a molecular biologist, looking at changes in gene frequencies, it looks as though most evolutionary change is neutral, non-selective. But of course, from the point of view of a field biologist who is actually looking at animals out there in the wild, wondering why, why they do the things that they do, why they run faster, or why they have sharper claws, or longer horns, or sharper teeth, or longer tails, you are looking then at real phenotypic changes. And so although the majority of evolutionary changes from a molecular point of view may be neutral, the ones that a field biologist are concerned with are the minority, which are the only ones that are interesting from his point or her point of view. Um, so the neutral theory is very interesting, it's very important to a molecular biologist, but it's not very important to a field biologist or an ethologist uh, like me. Can, can I ask you one last question? Because actually then the, we'll have a break. And, and, um, but, but one question. Um, do you think that the technology that we are developing in your field of science, for example, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technologies and so on, will that be a game changer? I mean, will it... Will we, as a species, change the process of evolution uh, through those technologies? Yes, I mean, it, it certainly is a, is a game changer in all sorts of ways, the technology. Mm. Um, it's not a game changer from the point of view of my view of evolution at all, it doesn't make any difference. Mm. But um, from the point of view of what can be done in the way of um, Breeding animals, breeding plants, it, it's a huge game changer, yes. Mm. Hannah, what's your take on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I agree. It's a, it's a technological uh, mm. game changer, but, but evolution will um, be... Uh, yeah. uh, work in the same way. Yeah, work in the same yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, of it will help us to, for example, uh, perform artificial selection, which is a strong, like a selection that we impose on, on domestic animals and plants, for example. It will help us to speed up... We've been doing process. that for thousands of years. Yeah. Yes. But mm. this, uh, the new technology will help us to speed this up, but it yeah. will still be the same. Uh, it will be more precise yeah. and, and faster, and I guess. And faster, but it will be following the same sort of principles of um, changing. Have you, uh, have you been thinking at all about the ethical consequences of this? I mean, do you have opinions on that, Richard, Hannah? Um, well, I think you have to be careful. You op operate the precautionary principle. I wouldn't call it ethical so much as... as practical and political mm. and um, sensible. Um, you, you have to be very careful when you're dealing with new techniques to think about all the consequences before you mm. blunder in. Mm. Is this something you discuss yes. with students? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yes, for example, um, if we're talking about those type of ultra-selfish elements that I have worked on, one uh, applied aspect of this kind of... Uh, um, genetics is to introduce a new trait into an already existing population. And this is, could be very, uh, possibly very um, powerful in that you don't have to, uh, to change the population, just introduce a gene that will spread, uh, and if it's linked to something, another trait you want to introduce, you have a very powerful tool. But then I think what we have to be very careful about is, is whether this trait then can spread to other species or mm. what other consequences there can be, which I think can be uh, probably very... Um, Dest destructive if we are not careful. So I think there are many, mm. many precautions mm. we have to take in, in before we start manipulating nature too much. Mm. Mm. Okay, we actually have to stop there to be able to take a 20-minute break. Um, after the break, we will discuss the public understanding of science, so it will be a little bit less complicated words in that part, <laughs> maybe. Uh, Hannah, Richard, thank you so much for thank this you. moment. Thank you. We're going to talk about public understanding of science. Uh, you were the uh, Simone professor in the public understanding of science. And uh, that was a special professor chair designed for that.
topic by a Microsoft entrepreneur, right? Yes. Charles Simony. Yes. Did you know him? Well, I, I, I got to know him through that. I didn't know him before. Mm -hmm. um, he's a very nice fellow. He's, a, he's very intelligent, brilliant software engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the architect of the original Microsoft Office, mm. uh, which mm. was, of course, developed much further after that. Um, he, he's left, I think, to found his own software company more, more, more recently. Mm -hmm. um, he's Hungarian originally, yeah. and um, uh, but did most of his life in America. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's, it's, I think it's more important than ever these days, of course, to, to work on the public understanding on science, not only on science itself. We're going to talk about this now for a while, and I want to invite our second guest for the evening, um, the physician, psychiatrist, author, television profile, Anders Hansen. Welcome. <laughs> Anders, you, you've had your own TV show uh, now for a few years, right? Mm -hmm. on, on, on public service television. And Richard's been on. Sorry? Richard's yes, been I on know, the program. I, I know, yes. I know. The, the program is called Your Brain in, yes. in Swedish. Uh, uh, and you interviewed Richard for one of the programs, one yes. of the shows, right? Right. I must ask you, I, I'm quite sure that you have seen many of Richard's BBC mm. uh, programs, do, uh, I mean science documentaries. Were you inspired by them in some sense? I'm, I mean, not only inspired in the general sense, but did you use the format and the communication attitude in any way from Richard's program? Well, what I always wanted to do was to create this sense of wonder that I think that you have managed to do so well in your books. And I've always considered myself lucky because I was brought up in a house where there was a lot of books and there were mm -hmm. Richard's books, and there were Carl Sagan's books, and I have a very clear memory of reading Cosmos when I was seven, and just looking through at these pictures, some of them actual pictures or photographs, and some of them drawings, and sensing this wonder of reality, not yeah. just that it's beautiful, it's real. This sensation of wonder tingling up your spine is the source for so much good, I thought, and yeah. I wanted to evoke that passion uh, which I got from, from Carl Sagan and your work. So, so that was, uh, and bring that to a large audience because yeah. this needs to be outside the hospital, the universities. And everyone, or almost everyone, is interested. If you're not interested in the brain, you haven't been told about it in the right way. <laughs> I think so, sincerely. Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. Uh, Richard, one of your books is actually called The Magic of Reality, right? Uh, with wonderful illustrations and so on written for a young audience, I, I would say, right? Yes, and illustrated for a young audience. Yeah, so sort yeah. of not, not tiny children, I mean, it's the kind of 12-year-old. 12, 12 yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you sort of go into this section of public understanding from, you sort of left the, the pure research field and went into the public understanding? Why, why did that happen for you? I think that scientists, as far as possible, ought to write their books and papers as if for a lay audience as well as for each other. And I actually think that if we did that more, we'd understand what we ourselves are doing better if we write for uh, <coughs> lay pe people. Uh, um, if, we, if we depart from the sort of esoteric language that we're kind of used to using, I, I think we actually understand better what we're doing and mm. and when you've when you've really had to when you've explained something to mm. other people especially yeah. to a child yeah uh, you really have to understand it yeah that's so true i mean i'm a, I'm a writer myself and i always said that the best way to learn a subject yeah. is to write a book about it mm -hmm. that's how you learn to learn the subject for, for real um but i know there are there are video clips on youtube where you I guess you're around 30 years old or something, where you do television programs for children, right? Teaching science. It's kind of you to say I was, I was actually 50 when I, when I did this. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. You look like 30, <laughs> I can tell you that. OK. Um, you're, you're, you're talking about the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, which is, yes. a, which is an institution that was started by Michael Faraday in the early 19th century 
Uh, he himself gave the Christmas lectures many times, and they're aimed at what he called a, a young auditory. Yeah. And uh, they are five lectures given around Christmas time and broadcast by the BBC um, to a fairly niche audience, I suppose, but, but, but five solid hours of, of television devoted to these lectures. There's a tradition in the Christmas lectures to do demonstrations. Mm -hmm. You tend not to do, they discourage slides, they discourage PowerPoint kind of things. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're supposed to bring children up out of the audience um, to um, assist in demonstrations. It's a fairly futile exercise. I mean, you don't really need them. It's a bit like a conjurer um, yeah, yeah. Bringing, bringing people up. I had one <laughs> nice episode when I wanted um, to, to read a passage from Douglas Adams's restaurant at the end of the universe. I, I, perhaps you know Douglas Adams's books. Um, mm. Hitchhiker's Gate to the Galaxy. Yes, and the, there's one, a, a magnificent uh, lesson in, in ethics where um, the, the heroes are dining in the, the restaurant at the end of the universe. And a large bovine animal comes up and announces, I am the dish of the day. <laughs> and then it, it explains that the, that the ethics of eating animals has long been problematic, and so it was solved by breeding a species of animal that wanted to be eaten <laughs> and was capable of saying so. And um, so as you can see, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting philosophical point. Yeah. Um, and I wanted that, so the normal thing would be to call a child up to have them read it, read it out. So I said, could I have a volunteer? And this enormous man stood up. This was Douglas Adams himself, who was about seven feet tall. <laughs> um, and he came up and, and read. Um, the, so I, I pretended to think he was a child and said, what's, what's your name? And he said, <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, so you knew Douglas Adams, obviously. Oh, yes. Have you read him? Yes, long time ago. Yeah, 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 long time ago. Yeah, it was Everyone fabulous. has read Hitchhiker's yeah. Guide to the Galaxy, yeah. I think. Uh, the answer to the question of the meaning, meaning of life in that book is... 42, right? 42, yeah. When I studied computer science in Uppsala University, the professors teaching Turing machines and everything, they always said, now we're going to choose a random number, 42. And it was always 42. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's, geeky, that's geeky humor, right? That's very geeky humor. <laughs> very geeky humor. But, uh, um, Anders, when, when you started to do popular science on, on television and mm -hmm. also in your books, of course, what is, <clears throat> how to express it? My question is, what is the most difficult sort of part of that project? I think it is to keep your intellectual vanity in check. You want to sound smart, and you have to realize that you're not there to sound or <coughs> appear smart, you're mm. there to make the audience understand. Oh, That's a very yeah. important part of it. Uh, and then, of course, also to, to try to inspire this passion, um, this wonder, this you know, science is not about charts or numbers or anything, it's about reality. The brain is not about, it's not, not nothing abstract at, at a hospital or university. It's where everything occurs in your life. Mm -hmm. Who isn't interested in that? So, <laughs> so now I, I, I was so fascinated by this when I was in an autopsy room at the Karolinska 22 years ago and I held the brain and I realized that this is everything. This is everything. This is as close as the inner workings of human I will ever experience. Mm. And, and then I realized, of course, that I have one of these. Uh, but what I took away from that day is the realization that this is an organ. Mm -hmm. And like the lungs and the liver and the kidneys and the heart, this organ has not been, has not evolved by coincidence. It has evolved so that it will solve certain tasks. It mm -hmm. is the sum of all our survival strategies of mm -hmm. our ancestors. It did mm -hmm. not evolve so that it should protect us against cardiovascular disease or cancer. It evolved so that it should protect us uh, against starvation, dehydration, stress, uh, uh, murder, etc., uh, etc., et because those things were the things that killed us, and we are the offspring of the ones who did not die. So we have all these tendencies, and basically the brain is not a neutral sta state that you could just skip if you want to understand yourself. And at the same time, it can do mathematics and philosophy, yes, exactly. and music, mm -hmm. and poetry, 
and can simulate the universe. Yeah. That's the biggest question of the world. How could an organ which evolved to survive in a savanna like yes. environment yes. travel to the moon and discover yeah. the theory of relativity? Yeah. That's yeah. just. We, yeah, we actually talked about it a little bit uh, before as mm. well. Mm. And, and if you take that question one step further, because today there is a lot of discussions on how can people believe such weird things like QAnon, conspiracy <coughs> theories, and so on. And I'm thinking, we haven't developed our cognitive uh, capabilities to, to know the truth, but just to survive. And sometimes it could maybe be beneficial for the group that you believe the same thing as they do, even if it's not true. Do you agree with that? Or? Absolutely. But to, to, to be part of a group was as important as having food. And yeah. To, uh, Is that the explanation, I mean, to why we believe weird things? I think so. I, I think that's part of it. We evolved so that we should avoid uh, being alone. By at any cost, and, and if there is a group and you adhere to its norm, the, 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 you have to accept its facts and its norms and so on and so forth. Uh, so believing the same thing as the group does is basically survival. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, we, we, a lot of cognitive filter goes down when we hear things that are opposing our group. We constantly see beyond the facts we are presented and see what are the social consequences of accepting these facts. And we that's what we have to overcome. We have to believe our group's nonsense or we get ostracized by the rest of the group. Yeah, yeah. No matter how nonsensical it may be. Yeah. Yes, and just knowing that firsthand is the first step of overcoming it. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I heard your, your, your talk in Gothenburg two days ago, and you mentioned this uh, experiment in America where you show a statistical diagram to a group of Republicans and a group of Democrats, and they make completely different interpretations of this statistical diagram if you tell them that it's about the effect of gun control, for example. Uh, but, but if you tell them that it's the effect of a mm, skin cream on allergy, then they do the same interpretation of the same diagram. I mean, if, if, if we are constructed in that way, how can you, as uh, mm, producers of public understanding of science, how do you counter that? How, how do you deal we, with I'm, it? I'm, I fear we all suffer from it. I mean, it, we, 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 we can't exempt ourselves from this. Um, I suppose, as far as possible, you have to ask for evidence, and preferably double-blind control trial evidence so you can't fool yourself. Um, but but it, it is a, it's a real problem. I mean, we, we do tend to believe what we want to believe. Yeah. But do you practice this in your daily routines? I mean, do you read an article from someone who you know that you disagree with to, to, to test your beliefs. Yeah, you should do that. But do you do it? <laughs> That's the question. Not enough. <laughs> okay. But I, do you do that? Yes, but not, not enough as well. But my, okay. blood, my blood pressure is not, uh, doesn't <laughs> like that. But, but, but I okay. think that what you were talking about earlier, about science not being an, just another story, I can't know quantum physics, whether that's right. Mm -hmm. I can't know whether there are black holes. I have to believe that because scientists say that. And why do I believe it? Well, because I rely, I trust the scientific method. Exactly. I know about yeah. measurements. I know about peer review and so on and so forth. Yes. So, how, so the key here is to spread knowledge about the scientific method. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Do you write a book on scientific methodology? Well, good luck with that. No one's going to read that. You have to start from somewhere. And that's where the passion comes in, I think. Yeah. Evoking the passion is the first step. It makes you curious. And then you go on, learn more, and realize, mm. oh, there's really rigor to this. So it's not quite that we accept on authority what physicists that we don't understand tell us. It, it's almost like, like that. But it's, uh, it's more, as you say, we, we trust in the scientific method. We know it's not a kind of authoritarian Pope of physics handing down dogma. It's rather that you know that physicists are subject to the same peer review discipline, yeah, exactly. etc., as we are in biology. Mm. And so that's why we trust it, not, not because of, the, of authority figures. It's rather that we trust the scientific method. Mm -hmm. Richard, of all the books you have written, your popular science books, which one are you most proud of? 
I, I never know how to answer that. Um, <laughs> uh, climbing Mount Improbable is one of the ones I'm most proud of. It's one of the least read. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, that doesn't always correlate, I know. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, <coughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty keen on all of them, actually, I must confess. <laughs> okay. Do, do you remember any experience when reading science that really evoked this passion, sense of wonder in you? Carl Sagan, uh, exactly like mm. you. I mean, I, th I think, he, well, here we are in Stockholm. I think Carl Sagan should have won the Nobel Prize for literature. Absolutely. Never mind science, literature. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. But... <laughs> But you must, you must mention Richard Feynman as well, I think. Yes, I mean, I find him harder. You do? Uh, okay. Uh, he, he did it, much of what he did was in lectures, and, and his lectures are published, and they're, they're magnificent. Um, I, d I don't like his autobiography so much. There's mm -hmm. a certain sort of narcissism about the, 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 the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> But w one of your books, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Unweaving the Rainbow, uh, taken from the, when John Keats attacked Newton's... Uh, um, uh, he accused Isaac Newton for destroying the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to the prismatic colors. I know that Feynman had a very good answer to that, but what is your answer well, to that? Well, Feynman, you're quite right. He, I mean, Feynman said you can look at a, at, at, at a red flower and marvel at its beauty, but yeah. a scientist looks at it and understands why it's red. Actually, Feynman got it wrong because he talked about insects being attracted. Insects can't see red. Um, but, <laughs> okay. but never mind. <laughs> the never mind. <laughs> the, the, prin the principle is there. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I think that I was just using the rainbow, unweeding of the rainbow as one example, but, but anything, um, the, the aesthetic appeal of it is improved, is increased if you understand it. It do yeah. doesn't diminish it. Mm. Do you agree? I, I, absolutely. I never understood why a deeper understanding of nature from a, na from a scientific perspective should diminish anything or drain anything away. On the contrary. I, I, mm, I agree. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that today in, in the sort of the academia, um, I read an article in Peter Singer's Journal of Controversial Ideas, <laughs> an article where uh, someone talks about cognitive creationism, uh, meaning that there are certain ideologies today that uh, doesn't accept scientific evidence because it, it mm, goes against the I ideology. For example, the discussion on biological differences between ge gender differences, for example. Is this a sort of general problem in the academia today? Cognitive creationism? That's not the academic I, that I hang out with, so, but I'm not sure. Maybe there is. <laughs> oh, I, I can't tell, say. I've never met it. I, I, I you haven't? No. Okay. What's it called again? Cognitive Co creationism. Uh, what they mean is that just like creationists denying evolution and denying all the scientific evidence for, for evolution, there are academic groups who deny biological evidence for, for example, differences between the sexes, gender differences. Yes, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> um, I'd never heard it called cognitive creationism. But isn't it a quite good definition? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that gave you something to think about. <laughs> you just laugh. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, another question. I mean, science obviously rapidly becomes more and more advanced and specialized. Uh, how should um, how should the scientific community act to keep the, keep the public informed? I mean, there are quantum physics, for example. It's quite difficult to write popular science about that because it's too mathematical. I've tried to read many books on quantum physics. And, mm -hmm. and, and Has it helped? <laughs> I mean, I think each time you read one, it kind of wafts over you and, and, and yeah? you, you kind of get a, bit, a little bit more than you did before. Um, I 
sort of got the idea that even physicists don't really understand it. Um, <laughs> they, they don't deeply understand it, but w what they do is, well, as Feynman said, shut up and calculate. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they know that they can deduce predictions from their theories, even if the theories themselves are incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. And those predictions are fulfilled to mind-boggling number of decimal places. So they've got to, be, in some mm. sense, it's got to be true. Mm. Because mm. the accuracy with which the predictions of quantum mechanics are fulfilled is, is, is shattering. Yeah. Um, but the underlying theory is so far from what we intuitively can grasp. Mm. Um, and it, in a way, it's presumptuous of us to even expect that we should grasp it because as Anders was saying, our, our brains are built to, to do other things and mm. they're not built to, to understand quantum theory. But, but nevertheless, we can do experimental testing of the predictions and they come out um, so convincingly accurate yeah. that it must be true. And even though you can't understand that, you could still get a sense of wonder oh from yes. it. I could see a lecture, a good lecture on YouTube, and I don't get the, all the details, but I sense the sense of wonder. And that's the key here, I think. You, if, more, if, th if that can be spread, an increased uh, interest in, in, in science can sort of spread in society, and then you start to respect the scientific method, and then you will yeah. gradually trust it more than just another so-so yeah. story. I suppose in the case of quantum theory, the sense of wonder is almost too much. You, <laughs> you wonder what the hell it's all about. And <laughs> that's a good point. That's a, yeah. But you try and try and try again. And it, it's that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, a, qu a question from the audience uh, that I would like to pose to you. I mean, th there are so many different scientific journals where scientists uh, publish themselves and it costs money. But there is this special category, I think it's called predatory journals, that they basically don't care about the quality at all of the article. They just charge you for getting it published. Uh, and they don't do peer reviewing and so on. Is, do you see a big problem with that? Is that spreading fake news in the scientific community? I, I'm, again, I'm not really familiar with that. But, um, do you not? No, I haven't heard it. OK. Because it, that yeah. kind of journalist exists. And, and so they, they publish anything without any yeah. editorial yeah. Well, the internet is that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, true, 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 true. Yeah, yeah. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But basically, these, these are fake scientific journals. Yes, OK. And for a layperson, it could be very difficult to distinguish from, you know, from a good scientific journal. It's a big problem. Yeah. yeah that, yes. Mm. OK, another question from the audience. Um, there is this philosopher in UK, I think, but I'm not sure, uh, Donald Hoffman who's written a book called The Case Against Reality. Maybe he's American. He's American, yeah. He's American, yeah. yeah. Anyway, he, he says that w we humans, we don't, we don't perceive the world as it really is. As it really is. We, we just perceive it good enough to survive. Um, and uh, uh, how close... The question from the audience is this. How close do you believe our perception match the ultimate reality? And what does this mean for our ability to understand the world? It goes to both of you. Well, his point in that book is that we don't experience part of reality, mm -hmm. a small register of light or sound and so on, but we, what we experience isn't anything. The, the, the probability that what we experience is reality is zero. That's mm -hmm. his point, I think. Um, and he says that basically what we are creating the world when we're observing it. We're creating the moon, this glass and everything, and mm -hmm. even we're creating space-time. So he's assuming that what this basic in, in, in um, the universe is consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I mean, that's of course uh, uh, just an idea, but he, he makes an interesting case because when you read it, you realize that whatever you're your, your senses are giving you is not the reality itself. It's, mm. it's, uh, 
it's just part of it, and it's biased by a lot of things. And his position is extreme, but sometimes these extreme positions can make can adjust your focus a little bit. So mm -hmm. I, I enjoy that book actually. The, the, this table appears to be solid, and and you can't put your hand through it. it it's actually empty space, mm. um, and. We, our brains construct it as a solid object because it's useful. You, you actually can't move through it. Mm. Uh, you can't move through rocks, um, etc. And so um, our brains construct a, a version of reality inside ourselves, mm. which is updated and informed by sense data from outside. But I suppose if we were the size of a neutrino, we would experience it very differently. It's mm. because we are macroscopic objects who move in a world where we have to avoid colliding with other macroscopic mm. objects, that we construct a reality um, in which things are, ap appear to be real, we call them, them real. Mm. Um, an another good book I recommend in the, on this subject is Steve Grand. Um, I forget what it's called. Um, maybe it's the nature of reality, some, something like mm -hmm. that. But Steve Grant, who, who is he? He's a computer scientist who does um, simu simulations of the world. I mean, uh, attempting to make mm -hmm. um, AI sort of robots. Uh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I met with a man today. We were sh recording a new season for this program, and he could echolocate. He was blind from birth. Uh, and so he and, and, and his visual cortex is pr processing information from his ears and his senses wow. to create something that is well, whether it's what we call vision is uh, who knows because he, who he has is, nothing. Who is this? This is a man. He, he's from, Go from Gothenburg. He's, he, he's blind since birth, and he's learned to to uh, to use his his. Um, his ears basically to see and what I if he's seeing well that's very difficult to tell because there's nothing to compare to but we yeah. did some tests with him and it was just remarkable he could see small crevasses and cracks in an in a mountain you know exactly how far it was from them just by listening to sounds and how it yes. bounces back and forth we can't do that because our visual cortex is busy with the visual information yeah but his has learned to use new information but so but he he's, he can navigate. That's what you're saying. Yeah, he's in, but not but obviously just not read. No, not not no, read. No, but no. he he's he's uh, he could navigate very precisely. He could mm. ride a bike and things like that, and he could detect uh -huh. objects that are just uh, one or two uh, centimeters high from the ground. Stuff like that. It's just it was just incredible. Uh, mm. And and I mean, of course, the brain is in a black box. It doesn't have any access to reality. It just takes the electric exactly. si signals yeah. that it gets, and it creates a world. And if it doesn't get signals from the eyes, well, then it will use the signals that it gets from the ears or from the mm. other senses. That's You'd remarkable. If, if you try to imagine what it would like to be a bat that, that, do, that does echolocation to the nth degree, a bat, a bat is flying around, avoiding obstacles, catching insects. It's doing the same thing at night as a swallow is doing by day, using its eyes. Mm -hmm. So the world, <coughs> the internal world that the bat constructs, probably is very similar to the internal world that a swallow constructs. Mm. One of them is using the eyes, one is using the ears, but because they both <coughs> need to avoid obstacles, and they both need to catch insects, they need to construct the same kind of internal world. I, I've even speculated that bats may hear in color because the sensation of hue, the sensation of color that, that, that we get is constructed in the brain. It's, nothing, it's, not, it's only incidentally linked to wavelength of light. For convenience, those red chairs there stimulate a constructing mechanism in the brain, which is a label for that wavelength of light, for long, long mm. wavelength of light. <coughs> when the ancestors of bats gave up vision and took up echoes instead, they had these internal labels in the brain going begging, doing nothing. Mm. Why not use them as labels for types of echoes, perhaps texture, perhaps tie the label red to a, a, a hard, smooth surface, mm, mm. tie the label blue to a soft, um, furry sur surface. Mm. Maybe a furry moth sounds blue to a bat, mm. and they 
shiny wasp sounds red to a bat. It's obviously untestable speculation. But why wouldn't it be the case? Why wouldn't the ancestors of bats have commandeered the internal labels for color mm. since they're not being used anymore by the eyes? Mm. Mm. I want to talk a little bit more about your, your uh, fantastic production of popular science books, Richard. And, and um, we're going to talk about God illusion in the next section. We're going to have a <coughs> some music in between. But before we end this section, I know that you're working on a new book project. And you told me that I was allowed to mention it. <coughs> Do you stick to that? <laughs> okay, it, it's called The Genetic Book of the Dead. Yeah. Um, and the title is the best part. <laughs> um, Explain, what is the genetic book of the dead? What is that? Well, because the animal, because any, any animal is multifariously shaped by natural selection, its ancestors, its ancestral genes were shaped by natural selection to produce a highly specialized machine that survives in a certain world, a series of ancestral worlds, it seems to me that means that the animal itself and its genes can be regarded as a written description of ancestral environments, ancestral worlds. It's going to be a palimpsest, a little known word. Um, it means it, it's used for documents. We used to be, you write over, over old documents for economy's sake. Uh, so you have an old document and then you, you reuse it by writing over it and then write over it again. It's going to be a palimpsest because there'll be ancient adaptations. So part of the description of ancient worlds will be a description of very ancient worlds. We all started out in the sea, for example. So part of our genetic book of the dead will be a description of, of Paleozoic seas. But then there'll be a description of Mesozoic land, and uh, you can you see how the successive layers of the palimpsest would be overwritten in previous layers. There's a, a trivial sense in which an animal has ancestral environments written on it. Any highly camouflaged animal, say a, a, a lizard, which is looking exactly like the sand and pebbles of the desert in which it lives. It has, its, it has the desert painted on its back, almost literally painted on its back. It's not quite literally. But, but it, it's carrying around a picture of ancestral... In, I say ancestral environments because of course the ancestral environments that, are, that provided the selection pressure to paint the pebbles and sand on the, the back of this desert lizard. Well, the perfection of detail of camouflaged animals is so great, it seems unlikely that that same perfection is not present throughout the fabric of the animal itself. Why would it, why would it apply only to the external skin of the lizard, which has this detailed painting of the desert on its back, I'm suggesting there's exactly the same level of detail of description of ancestral in environments is going to pervade the internal biochemistry, the cellular chemistry, the internal anatomy. Mm. A sufficiently knowledgeable zoologist of the future will be able to take an animal and take its genes and read the animal, just like reading an ancient papyrus read the animal, read a description of the ancestral worlds in which the animal's ancestors were naturally selected. Mm. Wonderful. I, <clears throat> I, I had the honor to yesterday get the first chapters from you of this book, and it's, it's going to be fantastic, I can tell you that. I, re I read some of it <coughs> already. Uh, Anders, before I thank you, because you and I are staying on stage, when the music comes on, because we're going to talk more about uh, the God Illusion project. But before I, I uh, thank you, I want to ask you, what's, 
what's, what's your next project in the public understanding of science? What's, what's going on? I'm not allowed to tell. I yeah, spoiled it. Come on. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, we're working it's on just new, new for us. Yes, just for us. It's a <laughs> it's, uh, new TV program. That's okay. the, the next step. But in the, in the same series or in? I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, we are very thankful for what you're doing uh, in, you. in this field. We, re we really need a, a Swedish version of Richard Dawkins. <laughs> so. Anders thank Hansen, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Richard, we, uh, we're now going to talk about your, your God Illusion project, basically. <laughs> um, you wrote this book in 2006, and I guess it's the book that has sold most of all your books, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how, <coughs> how did you get the idea to, do, to, to, to write this book? I mean, it's, it's not about science, it's actually about uh, a strong critique of a rel religious worldview. What, what was the driving force for you to write that? In a funny sort of way, I think it is about science, because I've, one of my points is that um, the hypothesis of an intelligent creator, designer of the universe, is a scientific hypothesis, an immensely exciting one. Uh, if it were true, it would be, if, if it were discovered to be true, it would be the most exciting mm. revolutionary discovery in science ever, I think. Um, because the universe would be a totally different kind of universe. Mm. <coughs> if it had a, an intelligent creator at the back of it, at the bottom mm. of it, um, my worldview is utterly different. It, it is that intelligence is a very real phenomenon, creativity is a very real phenomenon, but it's a phenomenon that comes late into the universe. It's something that develops gradually over a very long period. On this planet, it developed gradually over billions of years. Um, and it may very well have developed elsewhere in the universe, but by the same kind of gradual, slow, incremental process. That seems to me to be the only way in which you could get something as complicated as a creative intelligence. But um, the, the hypothesis that there was a creative intelligence right at the start, uh, and presumably forever before that, um, is a, a gigantic, it, though false hypothesis. Mm. Okay, but <coughs> okay. So you, you wrote this book, and then you came together with the these other three guys that you formed this concept of the four horsemen. I guess it wasn't your idea to well, call it. It wasn't our idea. No, <laughs> no, no, no. But anyway, you were called that. Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Dan Dennett, and and yourself. How did you meet? How did you get together? Oh. Um, well, we didn't sort of get together in any particular way. We, we, we got together once in Christopher Hitchens' flat in Washington. Mm. But um, we wrote our books independently. We didn't, uh, I think we didn't collaborate in any way. Um, Sam Harris's book, The End of Faith, was the one that came out first. And then mine and Dan Dennett's came out pretty much simultaneously a little later. But when you wrote your book, had you read Sam Harris' book, End of Faith? I can't remember that. Mm -hmm. I think I might have, I can't remember that. Um, I think I had not actually, but then mm. I did read it and was immensely impressed by it. I think it's mm. a brilliant book. I mean, mm. strongly recommended. Mm. Um, I, 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 I honestly can't remember whether I, I'd read it before. Uh, I, I met, I knew Dan Dennett. Um, he was the only one I really knew well. Um, I, I knew him from way back. Mm -hmm. um, he collaborated with Douglas Hofstadter, your friend, mm. um, in a book called The Mind's Eye, and they, and they wanted yeah. to reproduce a chapter of The Selfish Gene in that book, and so I co corresponded with, with them about that mm. and got to know Dan Dennett. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get to know Christopher Hitchens until later. Mm. Mm. Okay, but anyway, you, you formed this group that by journalists were called the Four Horsemen. That's a biblical concept, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ye yes, <laughs> from the from the um, book of Revelation. I think. Yeah, that's the <laughs> word, book of Revelation. <laughs> How did you feel about that? That <laughs> you were labeled with a biblical concept. <laughs> I, 
don't have a problem with that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just kidding. But I, I'm interested in one thing. I mean, we all know what, what, you, what the four of you all agreed on, but I'm interested in what did you disagree on? It was a curious business. This, we, we had this meeting of four, four of us <coughs> round a table mm. um, with, I think we had wine, um, Cr Christopher had whiskey, um, <laughs> of and course. we didn't have a chairman, we didn't have a master of ceremonies, uh, we just discussed, we just talked. I think if you listen to the recording, the recording's been available for a long time. Yeah. I don't think any one of us monopolized it in any way. I don't think there was any, any one of the four of us spoke noticeably more than the others. And um, that could be verified in the printed version, which has recently come out, and which you printed in Swedish. Yeah, yeah it's out in Swedish, uh, yeah. in a book, yeah. Um, so I think it's a, I mean, t to me, it's a good example of what you can do in the way of a constructive discussion that does not have a chairman. Mm. Um, we agreed about most things. I think the only disagreement, which by the way is not a bad thing, I, I, don't, I don't hold to the view that you have to have disagreement to make it interesting. Um, the one disagreement which did co uh, come to the surface was a fairly minor one. Um, Christopher thought it would be a pity if religion disappeared because there'd be nobody to argue with, <laughs> uh, um, which I thought was rather a frivolous uh, um, arg argument. Um, and and it, it doesn't betoken any very profound disagreement. Um, but it is true that there's a kind of popular myth that you have to have disagreement in order for it to be entertaining. Mm. You know, I, I came across this once when I had a, another very constructive conversation with Steven Pinker, the psychologist and linguist Steven Pinker. And we, we talked together on a London stage. It was quite a large audience, about 2,000 people in London. And the BBC got to hear about this and decided it'd be rather a good idea to invite us to reprise it on television in a program called Newsnight. So we agreed that we would do that. And then the producer, the BBC producer, telephoned me and she said, tell me, what is the nature of your disagreement with Dr. Pinker? And I said, well, I don't think we actually do disagree about anything really. And she said, no disagreement. <laughs> and the, the program was promptly canceled. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's television turning entertainment instead of yeah. knowledge uh, production. But I just think it's false. I mean, I, I, do yeah. think, I do think that people, well, I, I hope we've seen it today actually, that, that, yeah. that, that people can talk constructively, even if they agree with each other, mm. they can still learn from each other mm. and um, perhaps be entertaining as well. Yeah. We hope so. Yeah. We'll yeah. see the verdict yes. <laughs> later. <laughs> <clears throat> Richard, okay, I, go I got this question from the audience now on my uh, iPad. Um, are there any uh, beliefs, let's see here, uh, as, as someone tightly connected to logic and reason, as you are, do you have any irrational beliefs yourself, do you think? Probably, yes. Um, well, we, we talked earlier in one of the earlier sessions of the tendency of, of all, all humans really to be biased in, your, in their beliefs according to political prejudices, that kind of thing. I, I'm sure I've, I have that, that sort of thing as, as, as I think everybody does, and you have to try to limit that. Mm. Um, I suppose, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't hand on heart say I, I don't have I any irrational mm. beliefs. But it's probably hard to know which one they are. Well, by definition, yes. Yeah, by definition, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, another question from the audience is, is um, which uh, strongly hold theory or idea uh, have you revised during your career? 
changed your mind with that. Revi revised. Yeah. Yes. Or yeah. Um, probably not, not a very big one. I mean, the, the one I can think of wh where I was definitely wrong and mis mistaken was over the so-called handicap theory. Um, and in the first edition of The Selfish Gene, I ridiculed the handicap theory, which is the theory of a, an Israeli zoologist called Amots Zahavi. Um, he, his idea was that if you take, for example, sexual selection, a sel a, a, the peacock's tail is a proverbial one. So uh, the, the peacock's tail is clearly a sexual advertisement. It's, a, it's, it's an advertisement by males to attract females. That's uncontroversial. It is a handicap. That's uncontroversial. It's clearly a handicap to the male having to cart this huge, great tail around. Because it's big and heavy. Big basically. and heavy yeah, and, yeah. and makes it vulnerable to predators and it makes mm. it hard to fly and things. Zahavi's idea, which is revolutionary, is that it is attractive to females because it is a handicap. And Zahavi likes to use anthropomorphic language. And he says things like, look at me, I must be a great big fine peacock because I can survive in spite of carrying around this ruddy great burden on my back. Mm -hmm. um, and I ridiculed that theory in the first edition of The Selfish Gene. And then I had to climb down in the second edition of The Selfish Gene because my former graduate student, Alan Graffin, now my I would say my mentor, uh, Alan Graffin proved mathematically that the handicap principle can work. And it's a very elegant um, demonstration. So that, that's, that's one mm. mistake that I made. Mm. Mm. Uh, that's a very good example. Um, uh, OK, another question from the audience. If you, um, of all the people in the religion debate that you've been debating on different, different YouTube shows and everything, which one of all these opponents would you choose for a two-week vacation, if you had to choose one of them? <laughs> hmm. um, okay. Well, I, it looks as though I am going to be doing that sort of, with the former Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, really? Rowan Williams. Um, a, a television company is, has managed to persuade both of us to spend a substantial amount of time together, I think about two weeks together. Wow, Paradise Hotel. Um, <laughs> and I, and um, <laughs> I, I, I have encountered Rowan Williams on, I think, two or three separate occasions before. And uh, he's a very difficult person to argue with because he's so nice. <laughs> he, he, and and, and he's, he's so intelligent and he, uh, he's so intelligent that he finishes your sentences for you. So he knows what you're going to say before you say it and he finishes the sentence. But then he doesn't agree with it. <laughs> and, and, um, and it's hard to tell why. Uh, and, and as I say, he's so, he's so nice that it's very hard to to argue with him. Mm. So that might be one answer. Mm. Um, I had a, a televised hour or so with Father George Coyne, who was the Vatican astronomer. He, mm. he ran the Vatican's observatory. And um, that was very interesting because he agreed with everything I said. And um, I couldn't get to him to disagree with about anything. And e eventually I said, well, Father Coyne, I don't understand, in that case, why, are you, why you're a Catholic. And he said, upbringing, as simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I actually saw that quite recently on YouTube. And as I remember it, he, he couldn't really speak clearly on the virgin birth. Wasn't that the case? Um, I mean, he, he couldn't say that it's obviously not happened. I he couldn't don't say remember that. that. That that possibly. I'm so. afraid he actually. That maybe, yes. <laughs> so that's mm. because that's that's what I find also in, in the Swedish Swedish church. They they're not they're not very religious, I would say, but they can't really say that. Of course, it's a metaphor. Of course, it's a metaphor with the. Yes. 
or resurrection. Yeah. And as a metaphorical story, it's beautiful, it can have a, a, lot, a lot to say to us, but they can't really say it's just a metaphor. Do, 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 do you agree with that? Well, yes. Um, what is quite surprising to me is that occasionally I've found one of the sophisticated theologians who actually doesn't say it's a metaphor. He says he's actually, he does believe it. I mean, he does believe literally that Jesus turned water into wine and walked on water and things. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> do you think that you will, uh, do, do you think that you will sort of uh, mm, write something again in the tradition of the God delusion? Or do you feel that You've done well, that. I, I, I have written Outgrowing God, which is a kind of, yeah, yeah, of young course. person's mm. v version. Which yeah, I think you published it in you, Swedish. You published yeah. it, yes. That's true. Um, which is, it, it, it's, it's, not the, it's not the same book, but, it, but um, it, I suppose it, it is a, an answer to your question. Yeah, it's a little bit easier read for, for yes. younger persons. Yes. I, I agree. But, but I mean, are you, are you, do you feel that the, the Four Horsemen legacy actually made a difference? Or do you think the world is going in the wrong direction? I don't answer that kind of question. Because, <laughs> I, I, okay. I, I, because I haven't done the research. I mean, it, it's um, questions about the way the world is going in, in, the, in the way that mm. opinion is shifting and things. It's not that I'm uninterested. I just haven't looked at it. I, I don't mm. know whether... Um, we made a difference. I mean, the little data that I do know of suggests that the number of people who are, call themselves really or subscribe to a religion is going down. Yeah. In America, which is where, which is the, the place where surprisingly they they're an outlier in terms of being much more religious than the rest of the of the Western world. Um, but even in America, the number of people who they don't call themselves atheists, they, but, they, but they do not subscribe to any particular religion. Mm. They're the so-called nuns. That's N-O-N-E, not, not N-U-N. Mm. Non-religious, yeah. Not, yes. Yeah, they, yeah. They have, they, but it's not clear whether they are, whether they, they replace it with some other kind of nonsense. <laughs> like... <laughs> like uh, <laughs> Like astrology or Astro something. Something like astrology, yeah. yes. Because astrology is, also, is increasing, at least on the internet. So is that media. right? Yeah, unfortunately it is. Well, I think that the internet's interesting because, you, because people make little bubbles. They don't have to be in the same village together. They can, they can, con they can constitute a distributed village of ridiculous opinion. <laughs> like, well, th there's a substantial flat earth society, for example, um, who, who, who know each other and get in touch with each other all over the world and reinforce each other's beliefs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I hate to end this evening on a, on a <laughs> bad note, but I must inform you that this wonderful private theatre is next year taken over by an evangelical church organization <laughs> uh, called Hillsong here in Stockholm. And I'll make sure they get to know that you were one of the last guests here, <laughs> because then they will have to clean out all the demons that you brought in here. Richard Dawkins, thank you so much for coming to Stockholm. Thank you for coming. <laughs>